Hi, so my name is George Booth. I'm from King's College London in the UK. And uh, I would first and foremost like to take the opportunity to thank the organizers of the conference um, for putting on a, a fantastic schedule of talks. Uh, I know this isn't quite the format that they envisaged, but it's, uh, but it's an excellent program nonetheless. Um, and I'd also like to thank them for giving me the opportunity to talk to you a little about the work that we've been doing over the last year or two in, in my group. Um, so the work we've been doing very much fits under the umbrella of trying to use concepts from machine learning for the for modeling of quantum simulation and specifically the high dimensional wave function that we're trying to represent for correlated systems. Uh, so this is the work very complementary to the work that was pioneered by Giuseppe and many others that are, that are talking at this conference um, in using neural networks and neural quantum states uh, in order to, to describe wave functions. But we're using a very different paradigm still within the umbrella of machine learning and that we're using a, uh, something called Gaussian process regression in order to define these states. And they have very complementary uh, characteristics from the neural quantum states that are I think are quite interesting um, and potentially uh, quite useful. So um, if there's anything to take away from the talk um, and something that's sometimes uh, lost on certainly newcomers to the field is that machine learning does not mean neural networks. Neural networks are, are one very successful and some would say dominant paradigm within machine learning, uh, but there are many other ways within machine learning to have a non-parametric flexible model that we can use for high dimensional functions. Um, and indeed, these models have been used successfully in many other areas, including within condensed matter for doing things like parameterizing, uh, parameterizing um, force field models um, and, and situations where your phase space is atomic configurations. And this is really what we're going to be uh, looking at today. <clears throat> And, and really, the, 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 the main alternative to neural networks in how we decide to model these high dimensional functions is via something called kernel methods. And this is what I hope to give a very brief introduction to today. Um, now, the umbrella of kernel methods actually includes a number of other uh, sort of sub methods within it, including kernel ridge regression, radial basis functions, support vector machines, um, and Gaussian process regression, which is the one we'll be focusing on today because it's got this very strong statistical framework that it works around that's very useful in order to be devising algorithms uh, for, for, for optimizing these models. Um, I should say first and foremost that if this uh, work is of interest and you want to find out more, our preprint is on the archive. Um, and I would be very remiss not to strongly stress the contribution of two students in my group uh, that have really driven this project on and really been exceptional. Um, and uh, that's Aldo Glielmo, um, who has since moved on to CISA, uh, working with Alessandro Laio, um, and Yannick Rath, who is a second year PhD student in my group. So, so really the credit goes to them. So, um, at the core of kernel methods is really the simplest machine learning model that we could imagine. Um, and I do argue that this is a machine learning model, but simple linear regress regression, fitting a line to some data. Um, now, when you fit a line to some data, you are, you're fitting your data, but you're also allowing for generalization beyond the points that you actually have in your data set. And so that really by definition is machine learning. Um, it's very simple and efficient. All you need to do to do a, a least squares uh, fit to, to, to a line or, or a hyperplane in, in higher dimensions is just invert the distance metric between all of your data points, right? Uh, so it's very simple and efficient. Um, the number of variables in your model at the end is just equal to the number of dimensions that you're fitting the data in. Um, or alternatively, and this turns out to be quite significant later on, you can argue that the model is, is parameterized by the number of data points uh, rather than the dimensionality of the space. Right? You can parameterize a hyperplane by three points on that plane, for instance. Um, but of course, it's a very limited tool. It's a very blunt tool. And that's because the data that you want to fit is generally not 
um, it's not linearly dependent and so we can't draw a simple line or a plane through that data uh, in order to to find a good model for the data that fits the data um, most of the 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 models that we want to fit are highly non-linear functions of your input space and so Here's a simple example of this. This is actually for classification rather than regression. We have two data sets, uh, one in red and one in blue, and they're arranged in concentric circles. And we want to do linear regression on this. And there's no way that we're ever gonna be able to find a line that cuts through um, that data and linearly separates the data. So we can say red on one side and blue on the other. It's just not possible. But what we can do is we can non-linearly transform our input space and project it to a higher dimensional manifold. So all I've done here is I've got my original input space, X and Y, but I've introduced another dimension that I'm plotting the data, which is X squared plus Y squared. So I've non-linearly transformed my input space into a higher dimensional manifold. And what you'll see there is now the data is linearly separable. I can, I can, um, I can find a plane that completely separates the two data sets. Um, and that's because this, uh, this dimension will now take into account the radius of the, um, of the of the data so what are the properties of this and this really encompasses a lot of the um, um, a lot of the, the the intuition behind kernel methods uh, one thing to note is that this is a universal approximator for any data set there will always be a feature space that we can project into which will allow the data to be linearly dependent such that we can fit a plane through the data um, and and accurately model the data. Uh, the problem is, is that we need to know how to find that feature space, right? And it might be very, very high dimensional such that we can then fit a line through the data to accurate, accurately model um, the original nonlinear function in the input space. So we need to find um, an implicit definition of this feature space and be able to compute the distances between all the points in the, uh, in the feature space. Once we do that, we can do our nonlinear regression and we have a model for our function. Um, and the important thing is that that model can be made systematically improvable as long as you can systematically expand your feature space to exactness. So it shares that property of an exact limit with neural networks. So why would you be interested in using kernel methods? Um, well, one uh, fact, and this may be uh, a more um, sort of a more mathematical formal feature, uh, but they are very mathematically well behaved and justified. Mathematicians are very comfortable with kernel methods, mainly because of this idea of simple linear regression at that heart. So ideas such as regularization, their ability to generalize uh, are very well understood and there are very well defined concepts about how well things will generalize, how you regularize, um, how you regularize the fit and avoid overfitting and things like that. Um, and that's something that can't always be leveled at neural networks where things are a bit more complicated mathematically. They're also very easy to use and to incorporate things like symmetries and prior information constraints that you know you want your final model to have. Um, there are very efficient learning algorithms uh, that have been well developed in order to work with these, these kernel methods. Um, I'll return to those later. Um, one criticism that's often leveled at kernel methods is the fact that kernel methods are really for small data, whereas neural networks are for large data. And that's because doing this sort of least squares fit of your hyperplane is formally cubic with respect to the amount of data you have, because you have to invert this distance metric between all the points. That's not true for sparse kernel methods, uh, which scale linearly with the amount of data. And all of the work we'll be doing in this talk uh, work with sparse kernel methods. And so there's, um, uh, there's no cubic scaling with the amount of data. For those that are more comfortable with, with the neural network methodology, there is actually a constructive algorithm to map a kernel model, uh, a linear model in the feature space, to map that to an infinite dimensional single hidden layer neural network. Uh, so that's a very non-trivial mapping, uh, but shows some of the connections. Um, the key difference 
uh, between kernel methods and, and neural network methods is that it's explicitly data driven. So the data actually parameterizes the model and we'll see that later on. Whereas in neural networks, the data is streamed through the model in order to iteratively update and optimize the parameters of the model. Um, and finally, and this is a very, very important point, um, which we'll be making use of later, is that there's a rigorous statistical Bayesian framework, uh, which all of this sits within, which can be used to develop very efficient algorithms or to build in prior information on the state that you wish to model. So let's return and, and try and get an intuition for what the kernel function is for these methods. So we can write our linear model in this form here, right? Well, the model uh, is a simple linear model. It depends on our input phase space, which we denote with a bold face X. Um, and it's a linear sum over the data set, which we denote with this, with this T. Uh, these are the data configurations. This phi here is the transformation from your input space into your feature space. This is this phi here, this nonlinear transformation of your data. And then if you want to make a prediction on any other um, uh, configuration in your space x here, you need to nonlinearly transform the data into the feature space. You take the dot product in the feature space with all the data and then it's linearly weighted in the feature space by these uh, WTs, these weighting parameters of the linear model. Now, this is very difficult. We've already said we need to transform into this very high dimensional feature space. So we don't want to explicitly do this dot product. The aim is to be able to develop this kernel function here, which is just equal to this dot product. So it has the formal features of the dot product in some high dimensional space and allows for a comparison between any point that you want to predict and any point in your data set. So this kernel function here allows you to implicitly uh, perform this mapping into the feature space as long as you can evaluate this distance, which is the dot product between any two points in your feature space. So what is this kernel function that's key to all of these methods? Um, well, from a statistical point of view, you can consider it to be the covariance of the prior distribution, right? So that's saying that in the absence of any data about um, the, the object that you wish to model, how do you expect one configuration in your feature space to correlate with another? Right? So in the specific instance that we're looking at, um, how do I expect one probability amplitude on one electronic configuration to correlate with the probability amplitude on another configuration? Um, so in that sense, it can be considered then a measure of the similarity between the points in, of the configuration space. So in order to try and start to think about how we can devise this feature space that we want to project into, one thing we can ask is what feature space can we map electronic configurations into such that when their wave function amplitudes are similar, their position in the feature space is also similar. That will then mean that this provides a good way to understand how we expect the amplitudes on configurations to correlate with each other. This may sound like quite a difficult task, but we know from traditional ways of parameterizing wave functions that there are plenty of features that we can use in order to understand how we expect wave function amplitudes to change. And we start off um, with this sort of toy example of a fermionic Hubbard model. And this really betrays my roots as a, as a chemist. Um, we really should have started with spin systems, um, but we started with, with, with fermionic systems. All of this works very well for spin systems, but I'm, I'm gonna stick in this talk uh, to, to fermionic systems where we have the, the, the um, majority of our results. So we have two configurations here, uh, configuration X and configuration Y. Um, and um, we want to ask, how do we expect their amplitudes to correlate with each other? Well, the first thing that we could potentially do is we could go through and we could make a feature space which depends on the number of unoccupied or, uh, sites in the configuration, the number of doubly occupied sites, the number of up sites, the number of down sites. And we could just count them for each configuration. This is explicitly uh, projecting into a feature space and take the dot product. And that would give us a kernel function. And that's a reasonable thing to do. We, you know, just from experience of things like Gutzwiller parameterizations, uh, we know, for instance, at, at large correlation strengths, we want to suppress double occupancy. So it seems reasonable to characterize configurations based on things like that. 
Um, now, there's another way that we could evaluate this kernel function. Instead of explicitly uh, enumerating the features, we could just simply take this site here. We could evaluate uh, what its um, FOC state was, and then we could loop through the sites of configuration Y and count the number of times that the FOC state was similar to the FOC state of configuration X. Um, then we could do that for the second site on configuration X and loop through it. And we could write this mathematically in an identical, uh, uh, to give an identical value to this uh, explicit approach as a double sum over the sites of the two configurations. And this delta function just evaluate to one if the FOX state on site I of configuration X is the same as the FOX state on site J of configuration Y. Um, this is L squared cost, this is 4 to the L cost, but this explicitly grows with the dimensionality of the feature space, whereas this does not. And so that's really the, the kernel trick that we'll be using to ensure that we can very efficiently evaluate these kernels. So this we call the K1 kernel. It really characterizes configurations purely by their local occupancy. And as I said, that's very similar to the idea of parameterizing states in the Gutzwiller uh, form. You can do the same. You can obviously expand this to build in local antiferromagnetic correlations by taking plaquettes of two site nearest neighbors and then comparing those to two site um, uh, nearest neighbors in the other configuration. And you can start to build up these kernels in a systematic hierarchy uh, of this form. And we call this the K2 kernel. And the cost in this form is still L squared, regardless of the size of the plaquette that you're using to extract these features. And so what we're doing there is directly computing the kernel function with a, without ever explicitly transforming into the feature space. And we now have a feature space that is 16 dimensional. But we can, of course, carry on growing this. Uh, we can start to include plaquettes uh, at a distance. We can start to include higher and higher rank plaquettes, three sites and more. Um, and indeed, we can show that we can analytically resum the features corresponding to all plaquettes of all size, range, and topology, if we so wish. And that gives us a complete feature space in which to parameterize um, parameterize a, a configuration, an electronic configuration space. Um, that space, that implicit feature space, is actually much larger dimension than the Hilbert space of electronic configurations. But the key thing here is that we don't need to uh, evaluate that that feature space explicitly. We can compute this kernel function still in L squared time. Now, I'm not going to go into exactly um, how this is done, um, but, but if you stare at this equation for long enough, you can you can argue that this this counting of these feature spaces and taking a dot product is exactly what we've done with this function. Now, we don't want to weight all of the features exactly the same, so we can introduce some additional hyperparameters in which we can tune the complexity of the kernel function, the dimensionality of the feature space. And we do this with two hyperparameters. The first is this p hyperparameter here, which is an exponent. Um, and that tells us the cutoff that we want on the number of the sites in our features. So if we're only interested in low rank features, we have a relatively low uh, p. Um, and if we want to include the entire feature space, we let p go to infinity. Similarly, we have this theta parameter here. And the theta parameter suppresses the contribution of very high rank features. Um, so when we have features that include all of the uh, uh, large numbers of sites, they are exponentially ex um, suppressed with this theta parameter. So there are two additional um, hyperparameters in our model. Um, but the key point is that this is still a very cheap way to evaluate the similarity between any two configurations. OK, and so we now come on to the uh, the form of this Gaussian process state that we've called it. We have our two hyperparameters, p and theta, and it depends on a configuration x. Um, now we have our linear form, uh, our linear model here. We have a sum over our data set, t up to nt, the number of data configurations. So this is this explicit data-driven models that I was talking about. We have our kernel function here, which compares each of the data set configurations with the configuration which we want to predict on, this x here. And they're all linearly weighted by this w parameter. So that's a linear weight that's associated with the training configuration. So uh, this, uh, these terms here and these terms here relate to the data. So those are explicit uh, 
electronic configuration support points that we use uh, in order to predict any other uh, configuration in the phase space. And then this is the kernel that we have to evaluate, essentially this distance metric from all our other uh, configurations in the space. Now, what we've also done, uh, which may seem uh, a bit strange, is we put it all inside an exponential. So what we're modeling with this uh, linear model is actually the log of the wave function. Um, and that's done, um, we can see kind of physically motivate why we do that is because this linear model, we can see from our definition of the kernel that it's it's additively separable in terms of all of these features, right? Um, and if we want to ensure a wave function that is appropriately um, uh, sort of has an energy uh, per site, uh, which is appropriately intensive, or, or rather a total energy that's appropriately extensive, then we need actually uh, product separability of the features in our state, right? And that will ensure then that the data that we require doesn't grow with system size for a given accuracy. So what we do is we put it in the exponential and then we have a product separable wave function and appropriately additively separable total energies. So some limits um, that are worth exploring on the expressibility of this model, um, as P goes to zero in the kernel, we end up with the Gutzwiller really parameterization. Really, we're just parameterizing local occupation, as I said before. As P goes to one and theta goes to zero, we're allowed to parameterize all pair, um, all pair distances uh, in our kernel. Um, and then as P goes to infinity, we're allowed to explore the complete kernel with all possible features. And actually it has a very nice simple form in that limit. Uh, the kernel looks to be the exponential of, of this term here, which um, is often described as the Hamming distance, uh, which is a kind of a discrete, uh, um, uh, a discrete uh, distance for uh, between any two bit strings. So this was very reminiscent of a discrete version of the squared exponential kernel that's used a lot in kernel methods. So why have I bothered describing all of this in terms of these hyperparameters p? Surely we would always want the most complex kernel to describe all the, the, the most complex physics that we want. Um, and perhaps that's true, but, but oftentimes that won't be true. And that's just a consequence of Occam's razor. The more complex the kernel, the more complex the model that we're working with, the more data that we'll, be, uh, that we'll need in order to accurately fit uh, that model. Um, and so we want to be able to have tunable parameters to choose how complex a model we want, as long as we make sure that it's systematically improvable to exactness in this p goes to infinity limit, uh, whereby we have the complete feature space and we're able to describe any wave function. So I want to take a, a little uh, digression just for a minute or so um, to talk a little bit about the Bayesian uh, framework that this all operates within. Uh, that's very important to be able to um, work out how we can choose our data configurations. Uh, these are these um, XTs here and how we can choose the weights associated uh, with our data points optimally. So in the Bayesian uh, picture and the Bayesian framework for this, all of our variables turn into probability distributions. So these, these W weights here are now probability distributions with a mean and a variance. Um, and all of our functions, all of our, our, our functions that we wish to model are actually distributions over all possible functions. So rather than working with a single linear model, what we're actually taking is the expectation value over all possible linear models where we weight each model by the posterior distribution. So that's the probability of finding that model given a set of data. Um, and this is often sort of depicted in this fashion, right? So everything is just a, 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 an expectation value, but with an associated variance with it as well. Um, and we can use Bayes' theorem to show that the posterior distribution is proportional then to the likelihood, uh, which is the probability of obtaining the data given the model, um, and uh, a prior distribution, which is our understanding of the model in the absence of data. So how do we want to pick then the data and the weights? Well, there are very efficient Bayesian algorithms to do that. So for a given wave function, let's imagine we're given the exact wave function. Uh, Given that, how do we then find a wave function of this uh, Gaussian process state form with associated weights um, and the support points for our data set? Um, well, we can do that via a maximization of the marginal likelihood of the weights. 
subject to a sparse prior, right? And the sparse prior is very important. We essentially then say, we want the mean of the weights to be zero, right? That's our prior information. So most of them will be zero. Um, and then we just want to have an understanding about the uncertainty around zero, right? So we can then do this with a very efficient and deterministic algorithm, a type two maximum likelihood algorithm, um, which subject to this sparse prior, picks our best data by maximizing the likelihood of finding those weights given the model, right? And the prior ensures that we end up with a very compact data set, a very compact number of configurations that we need in our data set. Um, and I really want to stress that this is not a rate limiting step of the algorithm. This is very efficient. So we, we've we uh, haven't shown, but but you have to take my word for it that really then any state that we have access to can be very efficiently compressed to this Gaussian process state form uh, with a single parameter, which we call sigma, which controls the precision or in statistical language, the variance to which any state is reproduced. So given a desired accuracy, um, this algorithm will come back to us saying, you need this much data to describe that state to that accuracy. Um, and here's the data that you need. And here are the weights that you need. And this is the most compact set of data points that you can represent uh, in this form. If you want higher precision, you can increase this parameter or you can go to a more complex kernel function, which increases the intrinsic flexibility of the state. Um, but in order to do that, then you need more data. And so that's the trade off um, that is often the case uh, in machine learning uh, paradigms. So let's do this. Let's take a, a one dimensional Hubbard model. Let's take 10 site Hubbard model and we can exactly diagonalize it, give it the exact wave function, and then we can increase the complexity of the kernel. And we can ask how accurate is this Gaussian process state that we can press down to um, and how sparse is it? Right. So you can see that as you increase the complexity of the kernel, the error that you make in the wave function decreases very quickly. Um, and the amount of data that you need in order to represent the state is still very, very small. Eventually, if you want the uh, absolutely most complex kernel to high precision, then it actually selects all the symmetry in inequivalent configurations in the space. And so it tops out there at the total number of configurations. Um, but you'll see that essentially this is Gutzwiller accuracy and this is, this is uh, Jastrow accuracy. So you very rapidly decrease the accuracy as you increase the rank of the correlations and you can systematically improve it. So there are lots of very pretty pictures that you can form um, and insight that you can gain from an analysis of how the Gaussian process state actually picks the configuration that it uses. Um, and that can be used to gain insight into the nature of how the correlations uh, emerge in the state. Uh, however, unfortunately, in the interest of time, we're going to have to skip this. So we need to now turn to a, a, a numerical algorithm that we can actually use um, uh, and, and extract um, extract meaningful results from um, beyond um, just the information that we had from an initial state. And the first way we can do that is with some kind of extrapolation procedure, right? So what we want to do is we want to take our data, so our approximate probability amplitudes and our configurations from a small fragment of the system. So we can say, take a large lattice system, we can extract a little fragment of that, and we can diagonalize uh, the small fragment of the system in order to obtain approximate probability amplitudes and configurations on that small fragment. Then we can use this data to find a Gaussian process state over the entire system, where we constrain the, the features that are beyond the range of the fragment to simply be described by their mean field counterparts. And then we can just sample very efficiently this state with Markov chain Monte Carlo in order to extract the energy. So this is, is relatively crude, uh, but it's very simple and very efficient. There's no optimization of any parameters at all. All we're doing is taking the data from a small diagonalization of a fragment. And we're essentially saying that those features represent the correlations uh, over that length scale across the entire um, across the entire lattice. So essentially we're truncating the range of the correlations a priori to the range of the fragment that we choose. And you can compare that to, to methods such as DMFT. And we can do this, right? So on this x-axis here, uh, this is for a 32-site uh, Hubbard model. 
uh, at a u equals 8. And we've taken a fragment to be uh, just 12 sites within those 32 and just diagonalize that 12 site uh, fragment. Um, and we're multiplying all of these states by a slated determinant. So we include that, um, that the features beyond the range of the fragment are just treated at the mean field level. And as we increase uh, the complexity of the kernel function, so we increase the p parameters from uh, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, uh, and infinity uh, down in this little cluster here, you can see that the basis set, the number of support configurations that are chosen, grow in order to uh, accurately define the state. Uh, but as that is done, then the, the, the relative error that we make in the total energy uh, for the Hubbard model uh, decreases. At p equals zero, we have a parameterization that's very similar to the Gutzwiller, and so we get essentially identical energies. Um, and then as we increase, we can see we get to our final error here. Um, just by way of comparison, here is a uh, fully connected single hidden layer uh, neural network state. Um, and we're then plotting here the number of parameters um, uh, versus the energy error um, for, for comparison. Um, so, so as p increases, the complexity of the kernel, the required data also grows, uh, but the accuracy improves. Uh, so where are the errors in this system? Well, um, the errors result from the fact that the data came from the diagonalization of a small system. So long range correlations we're not accurately capturing at all, um, but also that the features of the model are restricted to the fragment size. And we can deal with this first point by saying, OK, all I'm going to do is I'm going to take my model at the end and I'm going to optimize those weights now variationally with variation on Monte Carlo. And I see that I get a small improvement. But it really isn't a huge improvement either. Um, so already just fitting to the amplitudes on a small fragment is quite an accurate approach without any opt further optimization on the full lattice. But that's going to be limited to, to many systems where we want to describe long range correlations. And so there's an alternative that we developed as well, which is a bootstrapping approach where we self consistently optimize the Gaussian process state in cycles of optimize, compress, and then explore the possible space of data. So you start from an initial state that can either be random or you can pre-train on any wave function you want because you can always uh, compress any wave function to a Gaussian process state form. Um, and you, you take uh, a sample of points. You then variationally optimize those weights. You then uh, perform the, 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 the uh, Bayesian uh, compression algorithm. This doesn't lose any data, but it hugely sparsifies the number of points in your data set without loss of accuracy. And then we can add more data configurations based on some, uh, some um, simple uh, metric. So it might be the largest variance of the local energy, or it might be the largest statistical variance from the model. Both of these are reasonable and they work similarly. And then you can go back, you can variationally optimize, um, and then you can um, uh, compress again, and then you can add more data configurations. And what you can see on the two-dimensional Hubbard model at six by six um, at u equals eight, where there's a quite complicated electronic structure, is as again we increase the complexity of the kernel, we can get a systematic improvement uh, in the results um, uh, compared to auxiliary field quantum Monte Carlo at half filling, um, and have a very compact representation of this Gaussian process state. Uh, so increasing the kernel complexity allows for compact and improvable results. Um, we seem to get essentially the same accuracy as the restricted Boltzmann machine with, with fewer parameters. Uh, but this really hints that we're now at essentially the nodal limit of the Fafian part of, of the state um, that we are, we are using to describe the sign structure. Um, OK, we can go to a much more complicated model as well, the, the eighth uh, hole doped 8x8 eight eight Hubbard model, where there's uh, strong long range order and competing low energy uh, uh, phases to find. Um, and once again, uh, we find that the, the, the Gaussian process state um, does uh, a, a decent amount better than both Gutzwiller and Jastro, um, and slightly better than the RBM, but, but essentially they're, they're the same. And we're confident that the remaining error is just in the nodal restrictions.
Um, this might be something that, that uh, we can discuss later on. I don't think I have time in this talk, um, but actually obtaining the sign structure and the nodal structure of frustrated um, and, and non-trivial fermionic models um, is something that's very difficult, both for these GPS states and the, uh, and the neural network states. And so that's something that they share in common. Um, and that's something that we're working very hard to achieve, both with uh, ideas of backflow that have uh, also being discussed in this, in this uh, 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 conference as a way to parameterize backflow parameters. But also in a statistical sense, you can enforce things like anti-symmetry into prior information. Um, I'm not going to be able to talk uh, too much more, um, but just to say that we're also working on, on ab initio systems and, and going back to spin systems and also looking at ways that we can make our data sets more flexible. Um, finally, with that, I'd like to, to thank the organizers again and ask if there are any uh, questions. Thank you very much.